can we can we at some point get the zoom name the zoom announcers or like the voices behind zoom to and announce we're live. like okay is that a, a signal to start or to wait a minute yes we're ready to start thank you for joining us Good evening from wherever you are watching. Welcome to the first ever, um, first event, first edition of the NBL Lit Fest presented by Bookbank. I could not be more thrilled to be presenting this first session to you. My name is Wanjiro Koinange. I am one of the founders of Bookbank Trust. You're going to meet the other founder during the next session. Um, and welcome again to the NBO Lit Fest. This festival is anchored in Nairobi's public libraries and it's also a celebration of Macmillan Memorial Library's 90th year. So happy birthday to Macmillan Memorial Library. May you have 90 more years ahead of you. And we also wanted to just kind of showcase um, the potential of libraries. We always plan to have this festival happen in the physical realm, but here we are and we're gonna make do with what we have. So Karibuni Sana, and thank you for choosing to spend your Friday evening, morning, afternoon, wherever in the world you're watching. Thank you for choosing to spend it with us. I'll take us through some quick house rules before I introduce the very interesting and energetic gentleman waiting to join the call. We've had such a laugh already um, as we were prepping to start. So some quick house rules. Please keep your microphones muted throughout the entire event. Um, this is a live session. It will feature a live Q&A at the end. So please submit your questions to us and the panelists using the question function on your screen. This event is also streaming on Facebook and YouTube because we like to spread everything out. Um, we're social, so connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. We are at the Book Bank everywhere on those platforms and the ha festival hashtag is hashtag NBO Lit Fest. Please tell your friends to come and, um, and, and attend the festival throughout the weekend. We'd also love your feedback. So we're going to be popping up some polls as we go throughout the conversation. There's probably going to be one on your screen in a few seconds asking you how you got here. Um, and we really, really value your feedback. So please um, um, get, give us feedback when you can. Um, before I introduce um, our two gentlemen for the evening, I'd like to thank um, our funders who have made this vision, this dream that Washuka and I have had for so many years a reality. Thank you to the Sharjah World, World Book Capital, Sigrid Rousing Trust, the Embassy of the Netherlands here in Nairobi, and we also have some incredible programming partners including the British Council, the Glasgow Women Libraries, who like are our sisters in library love, Sahifa Journal, which is um, such an incredible journal producing um, great work here in the city, and last but not least, least Baraza Media Lab. Um, before, one last thing is to say thank you to all of the team, all of the team at Bookbank who are behind the scenes in different locations all over our city with varied internet connections, making sure that this comes to you live and clear. Ses, Marianne, everyone, Jonathan, Washuka, everybody who's been working on this festival, um, we're so grateful to you. Now, on to the fun bits. I'd like to introduce um, the two speakers. We have the two incredible writers that are opening up our festival. I'll start here at home with Troy Onyango. Troy Onyango is a writer and editor from Kisumu, Kenya. His work has been published in Egypt, Wasafiri, Bella Magazine, Johannesburg Review of Books, Afrida, among other spaces. Um, he's also been published um, in the Kane Prize Anthology, which is called Redemption Song and Other Stories. Um, he's also a very much celebrated writer. He's received acknowledgement all over, from all over, including the Nyanza Literary Festival. Um, sorry, something popped up to my screen. The Nyanza Literary Festival, the Black Lives and Media Competition, Short Story Day Africa, and Bristol Paper Awards, which is one of my favorite kind of literary spaces. Troy is the founder and editor-in-chief of Lolwe, which is a journal where that is home to some of the most precious and inspiring writing I've ever encountered. If you haven't already checked out Lolwe, please do so immediately. Then, all the way from Windhoek, which I hope is why you're dialing in from, but correct me if I'm wrong, is Remy... No, no, it is, yeah. yeah. Yes, Windhoek, fantastic. Remy is a Rwandan-born Namibian writer and photographer. He is also the co-founder and editor-in-chief of Duke Literary Magazine, which is Namibia's first and only literary magazine. You need to understand the level of people we have at our festival this year, guys. Um, 
his debut novel, which is the eternal audience of one is truly a masterpiece. I know for a fact that it is my co-founder's favorite book. Um, she actually didn't want to host this session because she's like, I'll be too starstruck. Like she really, 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 really loves um, this, this text and I do too. Um, and it is available at at bookbunk.org. Remember to keep your microphone muted. Um, Remy's writing has appeared in the Johannesburg Review of Books, American Court Data, Granta, among many other places. He has won the Africa Regional Prize of the 2021 Commonwealth Short Story Prize and was shortlisted for the Akko Kane Prize for African Writing in 2020 and 2021. You can gather more of this incredible writer's work at his website, remythequill.com. Welcome to the Literary Festival. Welcome to Troy and Remy. Over to you guys. Enjoy. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, I really, really appreciate it, man. I, and congratulations on getting this off the ground. Literary festivals are not easy to organize, whether real or virtual. And so well done on you know, all of the legwork behind that we'll never know about, however long this was in conception, getting the necessary partners and bringing it to the stage. This is like the tip of the iceberg, but I know these things are not easy. So well done to you and your efforts and your perseverance. It's really inspiring. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this festival. It's, it's amazing. It's, I think apart from Afrolit, this is the, this is like, the only time Remy and I have been on a panel <laughs> because it's always chaos when that happens. So I'm hoping to <laughs> put you on your best behavior today. <laughs> uh, we shall try. We shall really, really try our best, Troy. But now that I'm seeing there's a sign language interpreter, I'm like, how hard of a hard time can we give her? I'm really looking at Liz and I'm like, ah, this poor woman didn't know what she's in for. <laughs> <laughs> Someone should have warned her beforehand. <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah. let's let's start with this. You know, this yeah, is yeah. out in the world now. You know, yeah. um, you wrote me a love letter inside it, which I will not share with anyone because you know we yeah. have to keep that macho hardcore. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> we have to save the best part of our relation for our fallout when we become bad art friends. You know, when yeah, you write some, when I mean, <laughs> when you write something that when we when we plagiarize each other's lives and then we start suing each other in the media. Yeah, and then I can I can write an essay and do yeah. thread saying you know how you are such a bad um, friend. But how yeah. does it feel? You know, just this is I know um, the book was out through Blackbird yeah. Books before, mm. but mm. now it's here through an American you know Man's International now firm. <laughs> so <laughs> how does it yeah. feel to have it um, yeah. with the wider audience? Yeah. And, you know. It's interesting that this thing is called writing cities. And uh, look, I have a very narrow definition of what international means. And for me personally, living in Vintook, anything outside Vintook counts as international. So when I when it got published in Johannesburg, I was very honored and very happy to have my work out of this geographic location. Yeah. I was very, very happy and very honored to have my work being read in South Africa, in select parts of SADC. And when it was picked up by the American publisher to be sold and distributed worldwide, it was intimidating, first of all, uh, yeah. scary. But then after that, you get over that fear because this is the realization of a lifelong dream, something that I've always wanted, something that I've pursued to the best of my ability. And so to have it out in the world is really, it's a strange honor. And I'm very, very, very touched by it that people show faith in this work. But it's also, you know, a career that I'm trying to make happen. I'm trying to get going. So um, I'm encouraged by this milestone to pursue others in much the same way that, you know, every milestone that Lolloway achieves, I look at it and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm inspired by it. I'm, I'm, I see it and I'm like, this is a learning opportunity, not only for, for me, but for my community and everything else that comes afterwards. So I'm always... I'm, I'm really, really happy that this is out in the world because it doesn't, not a standard, but it gives me something to aim for, not only my present work, but future works. Um, and I'm also really, really eager to see if I can get more people from my community to this space, to this platform, to this, to this level, because um, I don't think, I think one is too small a number to make it alone. And I think that 
really talented writers from this part of the world in this community whose stories would do well as well. Um, but the the past three months have been overwhelming, Troy. Uh, since the since the since the books release, the pre-release, everything. Um, it's on another level of uh, literary performance, if you can call it that. The virtual tours, the everything else. It's been hectic. It's been frenetic. Um, and I've done my best to keep up with the level, but I cannot lie to you and say that I have not been overwhelmed, but pleasantly so, yeah. because now I'm learning what it takes to perform at this level. So it's a new learning experience for me. Yeah. I mean, I mean, one of the things that I've also been very fascinated by, it's just how, how, much, um, how much of press this, this book has received. And you know, it's, it, it is a very good thing, but it must be tasking to you as a writer. Mm -hmm. Um, mm. when, you know, when we think about writing, we imagine writing a book, sending it out to a publisher and that, yeah. that's probably the end, but then mm. the reality of publishing and, you know, we've, you and I, we've been on both ends of, of the publishing, you know, both as writers, both as editors. And mm. the reality is there is more that goes into it. So how have you been able to cope with that? How have you been yeah. That? Yeah. I mean, you know, this, uh, we talk about this a lot in Lolo, there's <laughs> dreaming about a story. Yeah. And with Doke and with them, there's dreaming about a story. There's the hard part and discipline that comes with writing a story. Then there's the miracle and luck and good fortune of having something published, uh, of accepted. Then there's the rigor and perseverance of editing. And then there's that glory of publishing, which a lot of people think is just, ah, you're published, Troy kicks publish, and then that's the work done. No, there's another level to that called promotion. And promotion, I cannot lie to you, it's, I'm not used to this level of promotion or the intensity or the duration. So it has been personally tiring. Uh, I can be honest about it. It has been personally tiring to do the promotion work, but it is made a lot easier by the fact that I personally believe in the quality of the work that I'm trying to put up. And so if you say, Remy, we need you to do this, I have no problem doing it because I get to talk about something that I enjoy, that I, I really put a lot of work and time and effort in. And because I want to see the work progress through the world without my intervention. So promotion is really important. And I think if there is one thing to take from this experience is um, if you're going to take part in the publishing game, you're gonna be, take part in the literary world, you cannot avoid promotion and you need to find some way to uh, make sure that your work gets out because the editor can only do so much the publisher can only do so much I think in the world that we currently live in writers and artists must find some way to promote their work as well and so while it is tiring it is also rewarding because I know it is all of my own work this is my sweat this is my time this is a career that I want to do so um I, I, if, if time needs to be made to promote my work, I will make that time. Um, and I think all writers should start thinking about that when they submit work for consideration because try, I found something strange. If you put it out there and it gets published, you're gonna be living with it for a long, long time. Yeah. You can't, <laughs> so you need to be happy with the thing that you put out and you need to shout from the rooftops for, for it all of the time. And I think that's where, in some ways, um, a lot of the, maybe you can call it insincere work fades because, um, yeah, writers who are passionate about their craft will, I think they'll, they will find some way to talk about their work in ways that are meaningful to them. So I can't say, oh, I'm tired, but it's a good kind of tired. I'm working, I'm walking my own road. And so there's nothing more honorable than that, I think, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, when you were talking about that, I, I remember, I think, um, Zeddy Smith talking about reading parts of White Teeth now and thinking how, how different um, she could have written them. But you kind of got, got an opportunity to do that because when you were transitioning from your South African edition to yeah. the American edition, how different do you think the, the two editions vary? And you know, yeah. Yeah, is there something you had to change radically? Yeah, in the text yeah. That there, was, there was nothing that radically changed in the text. The story is still the story. Yeah. Uh, it's still the same about this young man who in his final year of law school has to confront his own personal shortcomings, his fear for the future that is to come and to find his place in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and his navigation of complex friendships 
uh, with race, with love, with attraction, with economic and class differences. The story is still the story. What I have found though throughout this entire period of time is the different ways in which editors will treat stories. Um, so with my South African edition, the first edition, I'm very proud of that because that was the story in its rawest form. I was really figuring out a lot of things out and I managed to get the big book that I wanted because uh, I, I still had that naive approach to literature where I'm like, a book must be big if it is to be a book. Um, <laughs> and I got that treatment. Um, Tabisa yeah. was a very supportive publisher and I was really allowed to, I was allowed to produce the director's cut first. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? The director's Snyder cut film. first. Yeah, the Snyder <laughs> cut three hours, just go for a full three hours. Yeah. Um, with the American edition, it was different. They said, okay, so we need to trim it a little bit, uh, uh, trim it down. Mm -hmm. And it was, at first it was intimidating and scary for me because I'm like, no, nobody touches my work, it's been published. But then they show you these interesting tricks that show you that, you know, you can still achieve the same effect with this. You don't need three sentences to achieve the same thing. You can do it with one. So for me, it was, a, it was less of a radical transformation of the story, but more of a radical transformation of the writer. And Troy, I promise you, I'm never writing anything as long as the first thing. I'm never, I'm never doing this again. This was stupid. Like, I'm never writing anything this, longer this again. Is, this is a lie because knowing you, <laughs> knowing you bruh, you said try, try. you said no, no, no. a 7,000 word short story written in the second person. I will never forgive you for that. So, and first I, of all, first of all, Troy, Troy, <laughs> so you've always complained that it is 7,000 words in the second person. You've never complained that it's not lit so i don't care about your complaints no, your complaints we, are out the window anyway it, it was lit it was very lit anyway <laughs> anyway um what i learned with this book was um different editors different markets different parts of the world value different things in storytelling and they really bring that out to the page and i learned so much from both of them i don't think either one is better than the other they're just different different interpretations of the same story. But the story is strange because it still stays, it's still the same. Um, yeah. The word count might be a little bit thinner, but the story is a story. And I got to keep all of the things that I consider to be funny, to be good, to be rich and interesting in the narrative. And it's just, it's a strange interpretation. This will be like, I guess what you call the cinematic release since I've had the Schneider cut. And it's wonderful to see it reach is, a wider audience, yeah. This is the radio edition. Radio <laughs> edition. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, something, something, um, something I I kept wondering as as I was reading this is, you know, we we meet Seraphine and you know yeah. we 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 are we are taken through um, a journey of his. I don't know, can I call it youth? Because he's yeah. he's relatively yeah. young. He's he's struggling to reconcile um, mm. the the creative world. The mm. the, the African parent, you know, expectations mm. of law school and all of that. And, you know, both you and me went to law school and then yeah. the writing thing came along. And it's, I know, I know Coetzee says all writing is autobiographical. Yeah. So yeah. How much of you? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get ah, out of the way. Troy. Troy. Of, is this, is this, is this a memoir disguised as a novel or you uh, <laughs> i knew i i knew i was going to be trolled but i didn't know i was going to be trolled this intimately wow Troy, i really do hate you i really do hate you i realized why Listen. i realized why i hate you and this is why uh, all but, those all those all those americans reviewing your book do not have the audacity to ask you this so if i don't ask you this no one else is going to ask you no nah, a lot so of just people. tell us <laughs> how much no. of and and again and again um it's again it's it, it is an interesting question it's not something that annoys me or, or frustrates me yeah. and to be honest the how much of the autobiography or how much is this me in the story is this a memoir disguised as fiction is that no it's not disguised as fiction because i really do think that if i wanted to write about myself i would have the confidence to do it um although i know that my personal life is not that interesting or worth writing about in a memoir format. Yeah. And so fiction is this wonderful thing where you can take select parts of life or things that have happened in and around you 
and you can interpret them in different ways. So, I mean, you know, did I go to law school? Yes. Was my law school as interesting or as diverse as the one in the eternal ends of one? Heck to the no. No, yeah. not at all. Yeah. Fiction allows you to enhance details to an unrealistic degree that doesn't exist in the world. You know, have I been to Cape Town? Yes, but is Seraphine's Cape Town my version of Cape Town? No. Mine was probably a little simultaneously more aggressive, but also more nurturing. I had a different social circle of friends. Uh, I was around people who really cared for me deeply, who were invested in my personal well-being. So my relationships with my friends or with other people were not fleeting in nature. They were very intense because we were all trying to survive this very harsh city. Um, do I have brothers, younger brothers? Yes, I have two younger brothers, but I also have an older sister. So yeah. it's not my family. Yeah. Uh, do I have a mom and a dad? Yeah, but they are not like these people at all. Are they run that, yes. <laughs> are they, are they run? <laughs> yes, yes. And you know, again, yes. yeah, did I, live, did I live in Kigali? Did I live in Nairobi? Did I live, do I live in Ventura? Have I been to Cape Town? Yes, but you'll notice this about places that you write about. As yeah. soon as you write about them, they're no longer real because mm -hmm. things things in the fiction world happen differently to the real world. And so the Vintuk that you have in this book is not Vintuk as I'm living through it right now. It's different, it's more complex, more layered. And so for those reasons, I say that, you know, it's not an autobiographical because it's not real. The biography of my life, I think is a little, perhaps a little more boring from my perspective, yeah. but also to another third party, someone who knows me, it might also be a little more, traumatic for them based on what they know about my life yeah. um, and then lastly it's just real life doesn't allow you to come to satisfactory conclusions or to have bars on every page to yeah. to be lyrical about particular things no real life is pretty much real life you can borrow from it but once it gets to the page it's different and so again you know try the closing answer is how much of it is autobiography it's really some of it all of it and none of it yeah. And the best thing, you know this about your story, about writing stories, is some of the baker's sweat gets into the bread. Mm -hmm. And I have a feeling that's what makes it interesting. I mean, when you talk about this little light of mine, yeah. how much of that is autobiographic? Is it set in Nairobi and do you live in Nairobi? <laughs> I, I live in London now, so... <laughs> oh, oh dear, oh dear. So you've become one of those writers. Did you just like, recently discover that you're Black Troy? I mean... I came, I came to terms with my blackness. <laughs> I mean, I mean, one of the one of the most fascinating things um, I do in my fiction is, yeah. you know, when I'm doing the draft stage, I put, I I create worlds that I'm I'm very, I'm very familiar with, but then, kind of my editorial or my revision process is kind of like defamiliarization how much mm. of this world can i strip away you know mm -hmm. and i think that's why when i write my stories i tend to exclude things like gender i tend to mm. exclude things like time i tend to play around with certain elements just so yeah. it is not familiar to me anymore and i realize you know um the process of writing fiction i mean fiction by its very own nature is um it, its purpose is to kind of adjust the borders of what yeah, is reality yeah, to us. And, yeah. you know, my reality is not your reality. So if, mm, I, mm. if I am able to bring my reality into fiction, adjust the borders and then say, okay, now Remy, how much of this is your reality? Or mm. is my reality? It becomes a very difficult question. And that's yeah. why the question but, about how much of it is yeah. in place was more of a troll question than... <laughs> no, but, but, but I mean, it's such an interesting thing because... Troy, I don't know whether you've experienced this, but, you know, uh, to not to be asked that question, but, you know, as a writer, you will obviously use some real world elements to create your fictional universe. I always think about like, man, imaginations are great, but gravity is even better because it's yeah. nice to know that when you throw something, it comes back down. And so mm -hmm. um, in your fictional worlds, especially with a story like this little light of mine, I'm curious to know, um, if, for example, after writing it and, you know, now it's out in the world, people come to specifically traumatic incidents in the story or personally intimate details in the story and ask you, is this real life? And you're tempted to say, yes, but no, because 
you know, I'm, I'm curious to know about your interpretation of that question, especially with this little light of mine. Uh, it's, I think it's a good way to start because I find there's a lot of intimate knowledge that nobody, nobody would ever have written that story unless they know some aspects of, for example, human desire, wanting to make connect, desperate connection with someone or being yeah. on the online dating world or having that disappointment of someone say, I'm, I'm a pull through, but I, and then they don't come through, you know, yeah. how much of that was based on, I don't know, I guess real life I mean, to, to mirror the question back at you. I mean, this little light of mine is, is, is a story, you know, and we are talking about writing cities. Mm. It's a story that um, the questions of the story, you know, as you know, every story has its questions that it's yeah. attempting to answer. And the questions of this story came to me in Norwich and I was just thinking about, you know, how, how to write about loneliness because when mm. I was in Norwich, that was like a very lonely period for me. And I was wondering mm. if, this is, if this is loneliness in a palatable form, how do we write about that kind of loneliness that's very, mm. that's very brittle, that's very... Um, and I, I kind of had to go back to Nairobi in my imagination. And so this little light of mine was written between Norwich, Nairobi, and, you know, it was edited in London and I moved back to Nairobi and I was rewriting it. And when you asked me to submit it, I think I was moving between Nairobi and Kisumu at Kisumu, that time. Yeah. And when it was published, I was living in Kisumu. So yeah. this little light of mine was, is a story that's written between five cities, you know, Yeah, I can call it that. And I think when it started, it was very, it was very about me, you know, mm. I was, I was just writing about someone who was very lonely and was trying to get a connection through mm. um, an online dating platform. And then I realized if I were, and so this is where the defamiliarization comes mm. in, where mm. I was like, let me throw a spanner in the works and find out how, if someone who was differently able was trying to gain access to people through this portal, what kind yeah. of rejection will they encounter? And it was very, it was radically different from the kind yeah. of, you know, yeah. rejection that I would encounter um, on, on an app for it, on a dating app, for example. Yeah, yeah. So I think at the base, there's, there's, very, there's the element of autobiography, but I have gone through the process of defamiliarization. Yeah, by, yeah. You know, going back to that story, I think yeah. I, had, I had like, apart from your editing, I had like six drafts of this short story. Yeah, yeah. So, it's a story that was written over two years. I tend to be yeah. a very slow writer. So yeah. almost the work that I'm publishing now was written in between 2018 and 2019. Mm. And the work mm. that I'm working on now is like um, 300 words or something. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, I think at the, at the base, there is a lot of autobiography and we can never, we can never escape it. Yeah, don't you, find, don't you find that that's what makes some of like the writings that you like a lot very enjoyable because for you it i guess for me as a reader it never matters whether the work is autobi autobiographical to the writer i just need yeah. it to in some ways be autobiographical to some human being or to some way of life or to something that i can connect it so mm -hmm. the writer really in in you Troy Younger as the author of this little light of mine you're just like an avatar for this story about this other person but yeah. in order to create this other person, I don't think you can do that without at least having some human experiences. Yeah. And I find that's what I, I, I love about writing about stories when there's both the human element and that wonderful imaginative aspect where you transport yourself out of your immediate vicinity about who you are and what you can do as a physical person. And that wonderful part of imagination is something that's really, really incredible. And I've, I've, I felt that coming through in this little light of mine because you put this character through very, very tough situations, long <laughs> nights, literally, literally long nights of the soul. Yeah. And it was when I first got it, I was just like, yo, this is this is a lot. It was beautiful, but it was also a lot. And I found and you can't. I don't think life is like that, but fiction can be like that where you have continuous long nights of the soul and you can describe them ad infinitum and you can be lyrical and wonderfully descriptive about them. I love that aspect about it. And I think that is the part that I most 
miss not being asked about in literature, less yeah. about the autobiography and more about the imaginative part, because I yeah. find that's like where the awesome stuff happens. I mean, yeah. I think I think the the the, the deceit of fiction is mm. is, in, is in the language, how we use mm. to mm. kind of uh, mask things that we'd rather not um, have our characters confront directly or have yeah, yeah. ourselves as the writer confront directly. You know, yeah. um, I remember writing um, origami, and I remember even reading the, <laughs> yeah. even even reading the giver of nicknames, and it's kind of like yeah, this is horrific, but how, how is it written about in a way that doesn't, um, doesn't make the, the reader confront, you know, it's the mm. difference between a yeah. short story and a newspaper article. How do mm. we, mm. how do we manipulate mm. language in a way that mm. ensures that this thing is not, it doesn't hit the reader with the mm. same mm. Um, kind of like intensive yeah. force that it would have hit them if they were reading about it. Yeah, yeah, because, yeah, yeah. You know, I've I've gotten emails from people um, when when um, when this little light of mine was shortlisted for the King Prize, and I remember getting an email of people saying, "This is the first time I'm seeing myself as a disabled African person mm. in fiction, and it's written in a humanized way." I'm I'm. I didn't. I didn't set out to achieve that. Yeah, I set yeah, out to achieve, yeah. To write a story that was as close to the truth as possible, and if that, if people find, you know, solace in that truth, then I think mm, work mm. as a writer is done. And yeah, I mean, something I find um, very interesting in in your work is how, you know, you read um, the 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 granddaughter of the octopus. I I mixing up the title. I'm sure. Yeah. No worries. No worries. Um, but you read you read that story, and there's a certain there's a certain magnetic power to your work. It's as if it's as if your work is saying you're here now. You have to listen. And I'm always very curious about it. How how are you able to achieve that? Because even the give of nicknames from the from the from the first sentence, it's like you're not going to leave until you finish. <laughs> What, what I'm what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. No. Um. I hear you. I hear you. Um. And again, I'll reflect this back to you because I've seen it in your work, especially origami, which was interesting. The first bit of work that I got from you is I think there's this desperate desire not to waste the reader's time. Yeah. Um. And that is comes from a I don't know. I guess for me a realization that whoever is reading this has got better things to do with their. <laughs> have better things to do in their life. Like they definitely should have other than reading whatever the heck it is I'm writing from here about whatever I'm writing about. But if I'm going to interrupt their day, if I'm going to interfere in their one hour, how am I going to make sure that these 15 minutes are a heck of a ride for them or that they're meaningful for them? Yeah. Um, and that for me really is why, for example, like you were saying, like this little item was written two years ago. I think that's why a lot of my short stories as well, they were all written in 2019 or started yeah. in 2019, completed in 20, early 2020. It's 2021 now. It's constant revision, going back to the beginning and asking yourself, yo, is this going to capture someone's attention for 5, 10, 15 minutes? Yeah. And after they get it, how will they feel don't feel? wow, this was a waste of my time. Because, you know, this happens with songs, happens with music, happens with a lot of things where you feel like your time has been wasted. And I don't like that feeling from reading. So I try to avoid and put that into the writing as well. I mean, you did that in, in your show story as well, where um, right at the very end, where he's sitting waiting to see that the, open, the window is open. That was, for me, I was like, this is, this is what a short story does. It doesn't end. You always have this feeling of like, it's continuing through time, even if the writer has gone silent. And I, I you know, I, I, I remember when I got to your show, so it was late at night. And I remember really late at night and I was like, damn, it took me to parts of, of my youth where I was just like, I know this feeling. And I remember, I, I remember I called you up about it. And I was like, yeah. bro, how did you achieve this? Because yo, this took me to some, some dark places in my life and we had a long conversation about it. But I think for me as a writer, what you call the magnetism of the writing is less maybe magnetic, but more like just an intense desire on my part as a writer to make sure that the reader, whoever they are, wherever they are, whenever they encounter the work, they don't have their time wasted. 
And yeah. so I find that revision process to be the best part of the writing. I find the first draft to be get, get it out, but the constant revision of like move things around, shift things around. Yeah. So, I mean, like, I mean, you've never, you've never said that Remy, you bastard, you submitted 7,000 words in a second, in second <laughs> person. You've never come back to me once and said, but I didn't like it. You just said I was 7,000, and it was 7,000 words, Troy. No, I, I absolutely <laughs> loved it. But, you know, I, I have a deep disdain. I think there are very few writers, uh, and, you know, even with them, it's kind of like, okay, yeah, I have yeah. to. Who, who can write in second person? Yeah, yeah. Means me. Because yeah. I'm a very, I'm a very hyper-aware reader, you know? So, yeah. it does, like, second person is kind of like... Distancing. Oh, yeah, yeah, I want you to come into the text here, here, yeah. come. You know, it's very, it's very attention nudging, and it takes, mm. it takes very, and I think that's that's why I'm happy that you know Lolwe has guest editors because then my taste, yeah, yeah, don't get yeah. To yeah. Here with um, with what um the readers encounter yeah, yeah. today. No, they, I hear you. I hear you. Yeah, they get to choose second person stories, and I I can't explain <laughs> it because if it were up to me. I would ban second person short stories. Fam, every time a second person so sick is published in Lolo, I'm like, Troy must have died a little death when this was chosen. No, some, some, of, some of them are good. Some of them are, are really good. And, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm usually very supportive of the guest editor. Yeah, yeah. It's just not your, it's just like, a, I guess it's just like a dish that you don't necessarily like, like just like a yeah. restaurant meal. Yeah. But how do you, how do you go about ensuring that, you know, your work draws the reader in? What do you, what do you do like with your short stories or with all your writings? I feel because like you've also got that amazing story, Whirlwind in Jekyll. Yeah. Which was also another, another, I think, spectacular bit of writing. <laughs> I think the one thing the one thing I always do is I rework I rework a lot of my openings mm. in my head before putting it down in paper or on paper. I don't um I don't just get a sentence in my head and then sit down and say, okay, now I'm gonna write a heartbreaking work of staggering genius. No. <laughs> <laughs> it has to take um it has to take a bit of refining. Yeah. And I think um, you know. Speaking of not wasting the reader's time, you know, I remember Marlon James said when he's finished writing his books, he cuts out the first 50 pages and lets the story begin from there. And I was like, yeah. Damn, 50 pages though. 50 <laughs> pages is a lot. <laughs> but yeah, but have and you he ever was found like, that, yeah. He was like, well, most times it works because then you realize, and you know, you read his work and you can tell, urgent. That, yeah, there's that urgent. kind of urgency. I mean, I remember reading yeah. the book of Night Women and thinking, who, who, who wrote this? Who, who does this? Are we allowed to cast? No, Liz won't be able to. Yeah, translate. Liz, Liz won't be able to translate. Um, <laughs> it was just language. like, who, who is able to achieve <laughs> this? You know, who is able to, to do this? And, you know, Toni Morrison talked about. Um, when when she's writing her work, she she will she will give you the first the, the story in the first paragraph. I mean, you read jazz, and the first paragraph has the whole story. There's yeah. nothing, there's no new information that comes into that novel mm. after that. And you read Paradise, and she says, um, "Shoot the white girl first. With the rest, they take their time." And it is the expansion of that sentence that I mean, yeah. I mean, good. like how how can you not read something that starts with with that? Without opening, I and, mean, come on. And yeah. you know, I'm. I always, I always read interviews by writers because I believe in literary ancestry. I don't, I don't believe that we as writers we operate in isolation. Yeah. Believe, yeah. You know, I will read Remy's work, and if I read Remy's work, then who inspires Remy? And I will go back to who inspires Remy, who inspires whoever mm -hmm. inspired mm -hmm. Remy. And I feel like. As writers, we need to we need to always go back to why other yeah. writers do things the way they do mm. because there's nothing as powerful as intention in your work. If you can mm. justify why a sentence is the way it is, I I try as much as possible not to just put a sentence on on the page because it looks nice. It has to earn yeah. its place, and I, I believe you do the same because we've we've talked about this, and you know it is it is very. It is a very deliberate process of just mm, showing mm. care in your work. You know? Yeah, 
Yeah. yeah. And uh, I mean, since we're on the subject of writing cities, this little light of mine takes place in, in Nairobi and whirlwind takes place in a Kisumu-like place. Now that you've moved to London, are we going to get a lot of stories taking place on Camden fucking Heath? <laughs> <sighs> are we stories. about to get are we about to get fish and chip stories my brother stories like, in is Brixton. Brixton stories in Brixton <laughs> <laughs> well be prepared for some Croydon fiction <laughs> but no no I find that I find that the further away I, I move from Kisumu the more inspired I am to write about it you know I, isn't that strange I, I was born and raised there. I, yeah. I don't know. I don't, I think it's, it's the most familiar and it appears in my work more often than any other place. So I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Nairobi is just, Nairobi yeah. is interesting. So it's much yeah. easier to write about it. But I find yeah. the most challenging of my work has been set in Kisumu, you know? Yeah. Um, Isn't it's weird, like how you move further away from a place, but your imagination keeps going back there. Like, I've moved to different, I've lived in Vintook for most of my life, yeah. but whenever I'm required to imagine a setting for it, um, I always go back to the same suburb because I'm just like, well, the other suburbs are just wacky shit, but I'm just like, I can't even imagine a story taking place in this place. And I, I feel like that should be uh, a new baseline for where one lives. There are just some neighborhoods that are not worth the story <laughs> just like Vintuk has a lot of them but now that you've moved into moved your move to London and your you know you say your imagination still goes back to Kisumu what is it about that place that draws your imagination there and that makes it easy for a story to either start continue or end there like how yeah. do you go about writing this place yeah. I mean that's an interesting thing because you know for me what takes um what takes what takes the most what what I'm most preoccupied with in my work is language and I feel like to access the language of London to access the kind of language that to make me be able to write about this mm. very foreign place it will take me so many years and I struggled a lot with Nairobi I remember I couldn't write about Nairobi for a very long time so mm. I feel like the language of Kisumu is still very accessible to me yeah, yeah. In my imagination so the, the language of that place and I, I think it's the same thing with you the language of you know the place you can access the, kind of the most is, is what you tend to write about mm. yeah mm, mm. So, I agree yeah where where do you think your fiction is taking it taking you next you know? no for me it's always it, it always I think the suburb that I grew up in Vintuk West because we were immigrants um the, the, it's the first place that we lived in and it is the place that we lived in the longest and we continued mm -hmm. living there for many, many years. And we were very lucky that when we lived in Winter Coast, there were a lot of um, immigrant families like ours, similarly situated families as well. Yeah. And so because we managed to make this little community for ourselves, where we had a way of speaking, what you're talking about, the language of place, in and around that community, we knew who we were and we knew who we were not allowed to be outside it. And so whenever I come to the page and I'm writing narratives about people who don't fit in, they often always come from this similar background because I understand those struggles or those things very, very well. But at the same time, I'm also drawn to a lot of the other places that have been formative in my life. So I have very simple, simplistic and childlike memories of my life in Nairobi. And yeah. for some reason, that was my first big taste of what I'd call a big city. So it always sticks with me that that was, Nairobi was my first big city in the world. And so I have very simple childlike memories that I always go back to, often between early pre-primary and standard two is when I left. And it's always like a similar high school because I, I was also, it was the first time that I was meeting other kids who are not Rwandan and were living a life in Parklands. I mean, for me, the, I'd like to return to Nairobi to see how this place shapes up against my memory or whatnot. But well, no, that's another place. Well, now they're an expressway, so. <laughs> <laughs> there is a huge expressway cutting through the heart of the city. So <laughs> progress, Pro This is what we call progress. Um, and when I when I'm when I'm when I when I think about other places, it's often you know sometimes Cape Town. But it's so weird that you use 
these places that you know to imagine places that you haven't been or places that you would like to be. So yeah. even though characters might have, might be imbued with these places that I've been or that we've been in, I'm always curious and most interested in that other place that you haven't been in. And that's where I find imagination to be absolutely important. Like just yeah. in the liberty to imagine a place based on what you've read or what you've heard or what you've taken in during the course of your life. I find that very enriching for the, for the writing process. And I mean, like, you know, one of the characters in the intelligence calls Nairobi, Nairobi. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. that, that, that I think that feels like a bad right, especially with our conversations about it. And there's another character in another show story called Vintuk, Vintuk Worst. And I'm like, that about sums it up. This place is the worst. <laughs> it's so mm-hmm. weird that we still, yeah. But now I'm curious again, now that you're back in London, um, do you think, that, no, yeah, do you think you'll um, have a softer or a softer portrayal of the places that you might call home, whether it's Kisumu or Nairobi or Kenya as a geography. How do you think you that this relocation will affect your writing about place and cities and stuff? I mean, the last time I was here, it didn't affect my work. So mm. I'm hoping again this time it won't, it will, um, my work will remain um, untainted. Um, mm. But yeah, it, it's always very interesting the kind of questions you ask yourself about home when you are away from home. And I think mm. there's some, there's a, a lot of those questions are in this book, you know. Yeah, yeah. We 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 encounter this question of what really is home, you know. Yeah. And yeah. you know, I mean, for me, home will always be Kisumu, and that's mm. that. There there will never be a question of don't ask yeah. me where I'm from. Ask me where mm. I'm local, you know. Don't I. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. I hear For me, you. if you ask me where I'm from, it will always be Kisumu. You know. So yeah. yeah. I no, think, I hear you. Yeah, I think I think even my even my work, it's going to be very much preoccupied with that. I mean, even when I was starting my magazine, you know, Lolwe, it was the question of how do I pay homage to this place where I grew up, this place that I'm very familiar with. You mm, know. So mm, mm. you know and that's where the name came from that's where yeah. a lot of it um yeah and i mean it's, and it's so weird that both both literary magazines are named after places uh yeah. one with an old almost maybe forgotten name in the sense of lolloy yeah. and one after a new name that you're trying to impose upon the place uh, yeah. because for some reason now in my life i feel like i'm i come from duke but not necessarily from vintuk because yeah. vintuk comes with its own <laughs> sort of bullshit comes with other nonsense bruh so it's like it's so weird uh that both of them are like trying to pay homage to these places one from a historical perspective one from like a future tense narrative yeah um and i thought that was like just a little bit of wonderful scene. and i remember i don't know whether you remember but i remember uh when we first got set up and the wonderful zukiswa warner had put us in touch and i wrote you this email that says dear troy um the work that you're doing is amazing like please keep it on and stuff that's how we met we've actually never met in person <laughs> yeah, but i mean that that will happen soon i, I have yeah. a feeling, i have a feeling it will happen soon you know yeah yeah, yeah. and yeah. you know the kiss has been very instrumental to the growth of yeah lolway and duke because yeah she's kind of been the advisor <laughs> yeah fairy godmother yeah, um, yeah. For both magazines and so you yeah. know always it's always very good to have um you are talking about literary ancestry yeah that's very important but also community to realize that you know mm-hmm. with whatever you work you're doing in the literary field you're not necessarily alone and you're not always the first person there's always other people working in that community exactly. and exactly. that is wonderful to it's wonderful to just be part of this community in some way and yeah. so and- for me like Meeting you and Zukiso, well, those things change the trajectory of local literature over here completely. And you know, yeah. the, the the things that you've done via distance for our local community are amazing. I mean, like they've got to be on the Kane Prize shortlist because of you. Um, even before that, I mean, we took off after we met you guys, uh, yeah. the literary world outside this place. Um, and I thought that was just an interesting way to, I guess, maybe tie a lot of things together with writing cities and everything else. Is like Duke took off after we met Lolloway and it's been a wonderful, wonderful journey, wonderful journey to see how both of them have gone. 
Yeah. yeah, until we fall out and I write an essay. Yo, that's gonna listen, listen, listen. I don't know why you're laughing about this, but I personally have been archiving all of our communication for the very day that you know I see how ah, okay, Troy is not coming correct. That's when we go straight to the part. Troy is a bad hat friend. That's gonna be my thing. Bad hat friend. He stole my swag. He didn't even rec recognize me. And you know, I was. Uh, it's it's coming. The fallout is coming. We're gonna make a lot of money from the fallout. We just need to plan things correctly. Um, there, there's a question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now would be a good time to to, <laughs> to answer um, the question. Yeah. Yeah. Lucas is asking. Do you guys ever develop doubts after a number of revisions? I love the statement. Don't waste the reader's time. I mean, Remy, yeah. please please answer this. Um, I think doubts, I, I, I don't think I develop a doubt in the story itself. I just, I think in the revision, I might develop boredom. I might be like, yo, this is, even editing this thing is not making it more interesting for me as the yeah. writer. Yeah. And that's not, I don't know whether that's a doubt, but I'm just like, yo, I'm bored editing this. So I don't think this is going to work. But uh, I never have doubts about whether, one, whether I can write, I know that I can. I always have doubts about whether what I can write, I am doing it maybe to the best of my ability. Yeah. Um, or whether I've chosen the right vehicle for a particular story. Exactly. So I'm like, does it need to be sitting in this? Does it need to start here? Does it need to go yeah. there? Because yeah. I know the story is, it's about this guy who's going to wind up wearing a hat, but yeah. the steps he's taken, uh, do those lead? Yeah, do those make sense? And so those doubts that I, I developed in the story, and I think a lot of writing for me is problem solving, ad, ad, addressing those things. But where I know a story for, for sure is not going to work is when I just, I as the writer get bored mm -hmm. revising it. I'm just yeah. like, ah, this is not going anywhere. And that's when you know you're forcing it. You're really, <laughs> yeah, what about you? I mean, it's not doubts, more of questions. I mean, my writing process is, a lot of questions and you know sometimes i don't even have answers so there mm. are questions when people ask me about this little light of mine i'm like i don't know i simply mm. don't know you know <laughs> it's a question that i asked myself yeah i included the question there for the reader to also help me answer yeah yeah, but yeah. i don't feel like it's it's doubt at any point i feel have like have you yeah a you random know, question have you ever thought have you found that some readers want to relegate or delegate their independent thinking authority to you as the writer in asking you to answer questions that they should ideally be doing? Is that something that happens with your work a lot? Like, yeah, but I want you as the reader to think about it, not to ask me for the answers. Do you find yeah. that happen a lot? I mean, I mean, the, the, the thing I, tr I tend to do is to try and trust the reader, you know? I, yeah. So that's why I don't answer all the questions in my work. Some of them, I have the answers, but I choose not to answer them in my work. Mm. And some of them, I just don't want to answer them, you know? Yeah, yeah. Some of them, I don't know the answers. So it's always very, very, um, very frustrating when the questions that I, cho I chose not to because I trusted the reader, because mm. it, it leaves me with the question, then did you ask the question appropriately yeah. or did you yeah so it 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 leaves me feeling like i didn't accomplish what i wanted to accomplish mm -hmm. um but it is always very fascinating um when when readers come up to me or send me dms these days <laughs> <laughs> and Troy, are your dms still open why are your dms not closed my brother they're they're closed they're closed my friend that somehow, is where your downfall are that's, where the, they, that's where the next new york times they, expose comes from there's yeah. always there's always an egg trying to ask <laughs> questions <laughs> i mean if you don't get dms from degua i don't know what you're doing with your life so oh my brother that's the first thing i did i i, I blocked muted this brother because i'm like <laughs> i am not trying to be in the washington post for scandalous <laughs> <laughs> yeah but he's 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 a he's a really yeah he's cool, a cool, yeah. cool guy yeah um, okay Zinas so, has a question and i have one for you uh seeing how much you revise when do you know your story is ready to leave your hands oh i think it's ready to leave when commonwealth says the deadline <laughs> Ha, ha, ha. 
<laughs> first of November. First of November. First yeah. of November. So you That's always, the story you always know leave. it's ready to leave on <laughs> end of October. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I hear you. I think deadlines um, are always, I think deadlines are important, man. Like but, set yourself a deadline. Yeah, but I I feel like as a writer, you just know. You, it's it's, mm-hmm. it's instinct you know it's it's kind of like the question of where when do you know how to end a story you just mm-hmm. know you know mm-hmm. i yeah. mean i i like i like leaving a lot of stuff in the post narrative landscape so i will write a story till the end but i never want it to get to the end so like with this little light of mine i know the ending i know what happens in the ending but yeah. i will never tell anyone that this person shows up or doesn't show up, you know, mm-hmm. does our protagonist get laid that night? We'll never know, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but but wait, wait, I want to see, I want to see what Liz says for laid. What is the sign language for laid? I want to see, I want to see. Ah, she stopped. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I said this, so. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it these are these are things I know of, and you know sometimes I write stories all the way, and then I'm just like, you know yeah, what, yeah. I don't I don't need to have this ending, you know. Yeah. I I'll try and remove it. So yeah, with revisions as well, you just tend to know. Yeah. When a story. And then written. yeah, and then Mercy also has one. How do you deal with negative reviews or feedback from people regarding your work, Troy? I was I was going to ask you that. I was okay. I was actually that was like one of the questions that I was like now that the eternal logic. Is- <laughs> <laughs> Are you going on Goodreads? And, so, and, hunting, yeah. <laughs> and hunting those people who are giving you one star and saying you uh, will no. touch you. So, so one, uh, I don't engage with platforms like Goodreads, not because they are not good or yeah. necessary or whatnot, but it is my feeling for me as, as a creator that once you've made something, you should have the confidence to let it go out into the world for good or for ill. Mm-hmm. People will interact in it some way. I think you need to get some distance from your own personal work. Yeah. What I do know, and this is this is something that I hold dear, is that I I am more interested in creating the art than hearing conversations about yeah. the art. Yeah. So I don't necessarily engage with reviews unless my publisher or my agent says, you know, this one is important, we like this one, or whatever. I don't generally engage with them. And so even when they are negative, I'm like, well, you know that be it, so be it. What I can tell you though, is that there's only one review that I have taken personally, like, mm-hmm. and I mean personally to the core of my being. Um, and I have actively, I can disclose this here, this is recorded, you can keep it for posterity. I have actively trolled these people in every single work since. Oh. <laughs> You will never know how. You will never do, know do how. You remember, do you remember the writer who um, showed up at a reviewer's um, place, I think, with a baseball bat? No, 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 no. That's, 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 that's not that level. That's, that's not quite that level. No, no, it's not that. Uh, but I do think this happened at the very beginning of like the South African book's journey is um, there's only one, one critique of it that I just did not agree with outright but my my solution to that was not to like throw a tiff about it it was like well we're going to have to show the opposite is true with future work and that was the only one that I've ever that's ever really affected me that I disagree with but it is normal for art to cause um there will be people who agree with you and people who do not agree with you and you as the artist must decide what is important to you are you here for approval? Are you here to create work that is meaningful to you mm-hmm. and to others? Mm-hmm. Um, and then lastly, negative reviews. Uh, I don't know, man. I don't, I, I don't know. I'm ba- maybe I'm not mature enough to be speaking on this topic, but it is my feeling that you can have a festival of writers, but you can't have a festival of critics. Word. <laughs> so only one of these things really matters to readers, I guess. You can't have a... Can you imagine a festival of critics? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, one thing, one thing um, I, I'm being told that time is up, so we need to, yeah, yeah. We need to close our, uh, we need to close the session. Um, I yeah. mean, one thing you always have to remember as a creative is 
you know, as an artist is there's always going to be, to be people who don't like your work and yeah. you can never focus too much on that. There will always be more people who like your work unless your work is just genuinely bad. But mm. at the same time, you know, you have to, you have to know who you're creating for. And yeah, yeah. You, know, if you, if you appreciate your work and you don't, you, you know, you love your work enough, then that, that sometimes that's all that matters. You cannot yeah. go around hunting critics. I mean, yeah, Remy, Remy and I have gotten some of the sharpest criticisms for our literary magazines. For our Western funded rags, bro. Yeah. Our Western funded <laughs> rags. But you know, you just, have to, you just have to keep your head down. And like I always say, at the end of the day, it's the work that matters. It will always yeah. be the work that matters. Nothing else um, matters. And um, I don't know who said this, but you know, there's once you've put your work out, you know, um, and this is a quote, I think, saying once you've written a book, you know, you might as well be dead. So yeah, yeah, you know, that's about, um, the writer, they, you, you don't have to respond to criticism. There's really nothing you can do about the work. It's already out there. So you just mm. embrace it. Mm. You pick what's constructive and you incorporate it into your next work. You, you leave. <laughs> yeah, Try, yeah, honestly. There's also something I'd like, and this is something we're doing in our writing workshop over here. It's something that I found the best response to negative reviews or criticism or whatever, is that only a builder can give you constructive advice. Exactly. If they're not building, <laughs> it's not constructive. And it's a weird thing that I've integrated into a lot of things. Only a builder can give you constructive advice. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so now um, I see apparently we're out of time. Uh, yeah, so, so we need to, hey, 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 can, can these book bank people please put up a poll? I want a poll that says who wore their hat better, Troy or Remy? We need to sort this out today. The category not... is. <laughs> <laughs> we cannot go into tomorrow not knowing. No, let us, um, we have to conclude, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> some of us are freezing and need to go back to bed. Uh, <laughs> um, before we conclude this session, um, first of all, I'd really like to thank, you know, Remy for joining us for this, you know, being, being amazing um, um, during this whole session. Um, I'd really like to thank um, BookBank, the BookBank Trust for organizing this. And, you know, I'd like to thank the people that made this event possible, Sharjah Wild Book Capital, Sigrid Rossing Trust, the embassy of the Netherlands in Nairobi and all the wonderful people at BookBank who have worked for months to deliver this festival. Thank you so much. Thank you to the audience, everyone who joined us. I really appreciate this. Um, Asante Nisana. Um, yeah, and please be sure to join the other, um, the other sessions. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. So that we can all you know, celebrate yeah. NBO Book Festival. Yeah, no, thanks so much, Troy, for making the time, NBO and BookBank for doing the work, Liz for making it, uh, making it through the sign language uh, translations and everything else. And most importantly, I think for you, all the readers and everyone making time to celebrate literature, I think we need each other to continue pushing the work and everything else. I appreciate you all really for, for all being here. Thank you. And, and I hope this wasn't, and I need to clear this, this was Remy and Troy in conversation, not just uh, about me, but about Troy. So Troy, my brother, thanks for making the time in cold and freezing London. Thank you. There we go, votes. Everyone vote for Remy. Yeah, the hats, everyone vote for Remy. The comments have already said I wore it better. So yeah, just... but these are people who are trying to get published in, in Lolwe. I've already listen, been there. So. Listen, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to forget this. Please, please, please. If you are in any city where this book is available, please get a copy. We need to pay Remy's rent. He's starving. Um, he needs to buy a new hat. So, <laughs> please buy his book so that his publishers can get him um, better royalty. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, and you know, if you can, if you can order it off um, independent bookstores, it's even better because yeah, we're not yeah. trying to give Amazon all our money. But if you're in a place where it's only Amazon that's easily accessible, as long as you get the book, we'll forgive you. Thank you. Yeah. Those Thank you. Yeah. And read everything that Troy makes. Please support the work that Book Bank is doing. Public libraries are life, and so we need to protect them as much as possible. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for your time, man. Bye. Bye-bye.